Yes. <laughs> Okay, we are now live on YouTube. Está silenciado, ¿vale? <laughs> Welcome everybody to the seminar by Ana Flavia Nogueira, who will talk today about uh, the use of uh, synchrotron in situ experiments to characterize halide peroxide. Anna Flavia Noguera obtained her uh, degree in chemistry from the University of Sao Paulo. And then she joined the group of Marco Aurelio de Paoli at the University of Campino. And during her PhD, she also joined the group of Professor Durant at the Imperial College in London, where she also did a postdoc. She returned to Brazil in 2003. And at the moment, she's a professor in chemistry at the Chemistry Institute at UNICAMP. She leads the Laboratorio de Nanotecnologia Energia Solar. And the group has uh, advanced a lot and it has a leadership in dye sensitized organic solar cells and perovskite solar research in Brazil and also in Latin, in Latin America. She has uh, a vast experience in the field of chemistry and chemistry of materials with emphasis in the nanostructured materials and applications in solar energy conversion. She has uh, made uh, very excellent contributions in the development of perovskite solar cells, perovskite quantum materials, and dense energy carriers in the last, uh, in the last year. Uh, she has published more than 145 papers, seven book chapters, one book, and she also holds three patents. She's also uh, very active in uh, fostering uh, chemistry uh, editions. She's an editor of several journals, and she has recently uh, joined the, uh, the, um, as an associate editor of Journal of Material Chemistry C and Material Science. And also she has a, a very important uh, career in uh, as an outstanding uh, female scientist. And she has, for example, been recently awarded the CEN and CIS Brazilian Women in Chemistry Awards. So we are very happy to receive here Ana Flavia, who is really becoming one of the leading uh, female scientist uh, figures in the region. So Ana Flavia, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Galo. Uh, it's, it's my pleasure to be here in the same time zone. Uh, thank you for, for the invitation. I thank Ianina for arranging this, uh, this talk. Uh, so, why I decide this title? Um, I hope that at the end of my talk, I hope that I convince you uh, that you can do amazing experiments here, very close to you, because flying from, from Argentina to Brazil is just two hours, many direct flights to Campinas. So it's an amazing opportunity for the scientists here in Latin America with the series, the, the new uh, synchrotron lab here. This is now, and um, many of the, uh, many of the bin lines are under uh, scientific commissioning, but some of them are already open to, to external users. So I hope that, uh, as I mentioned, I hope that I convince you how powerful is um, if you couple some kind of in situ or operando experiments with the synchrotron here in order to understand, I mean, any, any type of uh, any type of material. So my focus today is going to be in a, in a light perovskite, but this is, can be extended to any kind of uh, uh, materials and, uh, and devices, okay? Okay, I cannot change. I cannot pass my slides, why? Okay, good. So where is uh, Campinas? So we are in the Southeast part of uh, Sao Paulo. We're just one hour by car from Sao Paulo. So this yellow dot is Campinas. In Campinas, you have the University of Campinas. Um, we just celebrate 55 years old. It's a very young university, but it's, uh, in, in Brazil, it's, uh, if you divide the numbers of um, production by faculty members, it's the most productive uh, university here in, um, in Brazil. Um, okay, so um, the moment uh, I'm, I'm also the current director of the CINI. CINI is the Center for Innovation on New Energies. So this is the, was the first partnership in Brazil with Shell. 
and Sao Paulo Science Foundation. Uh, we, we just have like now a milestone in, in three years of uh, CINI. We have published uh, more than 300 papers. We are about 270 uh, researchers engaged in, uh, in our center. Uh, we are now in a moment of uh, transition uh, renovation to more five years of uh, um, also uh, respect that it's going to uh, the majority sponsor for the next five years is going to be Shell. So that's the reason that we also we change some of the programs here. For instance, we have at the moment we have these four programs here: dance and energy carriers. What I mean by dance and energy carriers, like for instance, production of uh, green hydrogen, or uh, also in this program we have photovoltaics, advanced energy storage, methane to product, and computational material science and chemistry. Now for the renovation from 2023 to 2008. Uh, 2008 uh, we are replacing this, uh, this program here of methane to an entire program of hydrogen. Okay, uh, And also we're going to have a program entirely dedicated to uh, photovoltaics and wind power. Uh, so follow us, because now recently um, we just received an amendment from Shell with uh, about 20 uh, postdoc fellowships. So we, are, we, just, uh, we just start hiring postdocs for, for CINI. You can follow us, look at our website uh, if you're really interested uh, as a, to join us as a postdoc. So as Gallo mentioned, so my background was in emerging photovoltaics. So I started a long time ago with Dyson Sky solar cells. And then during my postdoc, I changed to OP organic solar cells and what we're doing nowadays. So basically most of my students are now focusing on proskites uh, for solar cells, for light emitting diodes, but in this case it's quantum dots. And also we are developing some new uh, materials for uh, water splitting, but not using uh, water and not uh, water splitting without water. I mean, we are using like the, um, the photoelectrochemistry uh, of biomass, for instance, instead of uh, using water as uh, uh, our uh, feedstock, we are using, for instance, glycerol or other products of biomass in order to generate hydrogen. Okay, so uh, I always like to start my talks with this, uh, this very nice statement from Barack Obama. Unfortunately, I cannot, uh, I cannot put any statement from our president, unfortunately, here. But uh, uh, what Barack Obama said a long time ago was like, the trend towards clean energy is reversible. And what I'm, what I'm going to tell is that we are living in a moment of the energy transition. So we cannot burn fossil fuels anymore. So, and I think uh, this time is, uh, although we are really, we have very um, important targets uh, for, I mean, long, long time for instance, for 2050s, we have many agreements, but we really need to think about like short for some actions in a short time because it is, uh, we are, the moment is really critical, especially because if you look at these numbers, we really have a, change, a challenge here in our society. If you compare the numbers uh, in terms of population, so we're expecting to have about 10 billion people in 2070. So we, of course, this is going to demand a lot of, a lot of energy, like the double uh, that you have nowadays, like uh, we really need uh, about 1,000 exajoules of energy. As I mentioned before, we cannot burn fossil fuels anymore. So we, we, can, we need to stop releasing CO2 and other gases in, in atmosphere. So we are, we are merging to, uh, I hope so, to a world with net zero uh, emissions. But of course, I know, we know that it's really hard to accomplish that because as, as I mentioned, we, are, we have a, uh, an increase of population and the increase of the population, you are not only talking about that we need energy for tra transportation and also for uh, electricity for all needs, for instance, to, for our houses, but also because uh, we're going to, uh, we're expecting to have more like small appliances like computers and um, mobile phones and all of these kind of uh, equipments, they also demand a lot of energy. And as I mentioned, we cannot cope with this uh, burning fossil fuels anymore because all of these uh, scenarios that we we, have, we are facing in the in the last uh, in the last years, and the problematic here is that when you look at the uh, the world electricity production, 
uh, you can see here in the total. Let me close. Let me close my. Okay. Uh, okay, we're we're doing we're doing great in terms of the uh, renewable energy. But if you look here in my pointer, uh, in 2019 was only about 6.6 .6 of the total electricity that it was produced in the world is comes from renewable. So of course this is is increasing. But this, uh, I mean, if you compare with coal and uh, and other uh, uh, gas, for instance, it's it's uh, it's, it's very it's, it's really shy this this number. Um, so we really need to do something in order to face the scenario that Shell just reported in 2018. This is a sky scenario uh, where they say that uh, the question is, is the future renewable? According to Shell, Shell is a company that uh, they always, uh, she's always likes to, they always like to make predictions about the future. And in some, she was a company that actually predicts the crisis during the 70s. So if you look at the sky scenario in two, by 2020, 32% that all of the electricity is gonna come from solar, followed by wind, 13% and 11% of nuclear. So we have now about, in terms of um, uh, solar energy, about 3% in total of the electricity. So then you have to increase to 32% by 2070. So how we can do that? There are many strategies, of course, to convert solar energy. Uh, here is just some of them, okay? Uh, the nature uh, just uh, gives us with the photosynthesis. Uh, we have, for instance, um, this is a kind of, as a photoelectrochemical cell, when you use like the electricity to produce uh, what we call like solar fuels. In this case here, for instance, if the water is splitting, when it produces hydrogen and oxygen, and also the photovoltaic where directly we can convert the solar energy into electricity. Of course, there are many other ways to convert solar energy, but of course, in, during my talk here, uh, the main focus is gonna be on the photovoltaic devices. So as I mentioned, we need, uh, this, we need a challenge uh, for the solar energy revolution because what happened nowadays, uh, the, uh, the PV, um, the solar panels, they are basically 90% are made of silicon, uh, where the manufacturing is uh, uh, is too is, is really is very expensive and also is very is energy consuming. So we need to go. Uh, we need to have other technologies that it can cope with this challenge that we we are facing in the future. So here, where the perovskite solar cells stand, is an emerging kind of. Uh, um, photovoltaic technology. You can see here, this is the growth. You can, let me get my pointer here. Okay, if you look at the, if you look here, the growth of the perovskite in terms of efficiency is really amazing. None of other uh, PV technologies has reached such a high increase in efficiency in a very, very short period of time. So nowadays the efficiency is 25.6%. That is higher than silicon, the, the uh, polycryst, silicon polycrystalline, and we are just one percent below the silicon, the mono, mon, uh, silicon monocrystal. Uh, we are doing very well. Uh, this is the what we call like perovskite uh, golden triangle that you can have for other technology as well. But for perovskite, you see that we are doing very well in terms of cost. If you compare with silicon, we are doing very well in terms of efficiency. And one of the problems uh, in a perovskite technology is the stability. Okay, so this is gonna be the outline of my talk. Uh, I'll give you a brief introduction about this kind of semiconductor, the light perovskite. Uh, and then I'll introduce some in situ experiments that we did here in Campinas from uh, X-rays to infrared in order to understand more about these materials. And then just few slides about the series, the new machine and what we can expect from uh, one of the, uh, the stations that we're using a lot, we have already started to use, that is the nanoprobe station. Okay, so this is the perovskite. Uh, if you remember your materials uh, chemistry classes, so perovskite describes a crystal structure. Uh, is, a, is, a, is a cubic uh, crystalline structure uh, of the titanium, uh, titanium uh, calcium titanate, as you can see here with the generic formula ABX3. 
where in, in the case of the perovskites that he, that we use for uh, photovoltaics, light emitting diodes, they are quite different from the perovskites that are used as a piezoelectrics or even for for photocatalysis. Why? Because of the composition. So in terms of the uh, for the perovs the allied perovskites, uh, we have on the A side here. We can have both organic or inorganic cations. For instance, methionium, formamidinium, cesium, rubidium, or a, or a mixture of these cations. B, uh, in most of the cases, lead. There's many attempts to replace lead by tin, but the problem is lead is tin two plus is very easy to oxidize to four plus, and then you lose the uh, optoelectronic properties of the perovskite. And X, uh, instead of oxygen here for the calcium titanate can be an allied or a mixture of allied. The most uh, studied perovskite is the methionium lead iodide or MAPI, but you're gonna see that most efficient solar cells are made by combining different cations and different anions in a composition. Just, just an example here, for instance, uh, from the group of uh, my colleague, Michael Saliba, where they use, for instance, in on a site, they use rubidium, cesium, and formamidinium, okay? And the reach uh, efficiency is higher than 20% with a really good stability. Uh, so the list of properties of the materials are amazing. So just this is all of the uh, amazing properties of this semiconductor. Uh, I'll talk some of them, just examples here. First is the high absorption. Okay, first is the band gap tunability. Because you can, as you can play with the composition, not only change the cations on the A side, but also the allied. You can, especially in this case here, when we are changing the allied composition here, you can cover the whole. Uh, you, you can cover the whole solid spectrum. So this is really nice if you really want to tune your your band gap your material. In terms of absorption, why these materials are really uh, uh, attractive for photovoltaics? Because the co absorption coefficient of this material is very high. Here you can compare with silicon, there is an indirect band gap. And also with gallium arsenide, there is a direct band gap. You can see it's much higher even than gallium arsenide. So this is very nice because you can make very thin solar cells. For instance, in our lab, the thickness of our devices is just around 400 nanometers. Uh, the lead, the, the lead light of sky is considered a defect tolerant material. What, what, the, what, what do you mean by, by defect tolerant material? If you compare with gallium arsenide and gallium telluride, here, here is the first and second generation of photovoltaics. You see here that the, the traps are located in the mid gap. Oh, it means that these traps are really deep. In the case for the uh, metallite perovskites, you can see here that the traps are shallow. It means that the energy levels of these traps are very close or even to the balance band or even to the conduction band. So imagine an electron here trapped in this acceptor here, very close to the conduction band. Any thermal energy can just make this electron jump again, just back to the conduction band. That's because that's, that's what we call like a very tolerant material in terms of defect. Uh, so we can also make these perovskite materials uh, in different dimensions. Uh, this is the most uh, known structure for the for the for PV applications. This is the uh, uh, the bulk mapping. This is just a, a, a standard SM image. But also you can have uh, quantum dots of perovskite. In this case here, the most com uh, studied composition is cesium, lead, bromide. It can see very nice. Uh, images of these quantum dots for light emitting applications. You can you can also uh, prepare like what we call like kind of a kind of molecular perovskite. It's not perovskite. That's the reason that I, I put in a in between brackets because it's definitely this is it's not cubic of course, but we call like a kind of perovskite structure. But also we can have these materials in two dimension. Uh, here is an example of this uh, metallite perovskite in two dimension. Uh, these are here in a big crystals, like the size of these two D materials, like is, is really big, it's kind of micro, micro size. But also, it can have what we call like a, a nanoplate. Nanoplates uh, is a two D with the size of uh, of nano. So these also are very interesting for these two D materials, not only for solar cells but also for light emitting applications. 
So back to the photovoltaics, let's back to applications of the photovoltaics uh, on solar cells, okay? So we can have different types of ar architecture. Basically, you have the, your perovskite film sandwiched between a whole transport layer and an electron transport layer. And of course, uh, we have uh, for this metal light perovskite, so have applications in light emitting diodes, lasers, and X-ray detectors, and, and so on. So, how, how do a perovskite solar cells work? So taking in this, uh, this configuration, specifically this configuration here, when you have your uh, perovskite and the whole and transport, uh, the, whole, the whole transport layer and the electron transport layer, for the electron transport layer can be, for instance, our oxide. And for a whole transport layer, for instance, the spiral is the most used uh, whole transport layer uh, in the field. So basically, uh, uh, we have absorption, uh, absorption of light to generate electrons and holes. The electrons are transported through this electron uh, transport layer to the IFTO. That's our um, uh, transparent, uh, transparent substrate, and the holes are then the holes are then transported to the gold uh, contact that, that is here on the top of the device, and then we can generate current and voltage, current times voltage is power. So one of the best solar cells is from my colleague Juan Pablo from Georgia Tech. As you can see here, he used a very uh, interesting, uh, he did some, he played with the chemistry of this uh, tin oxide layer here as electron transport layer. And they were able, uh, they use like uh, this other composition for perovskite, it's the FAPI, is the, uh, um, from a medium lead iodide perovskite, uh, they, they achieve about 25% of efficiency. So, and so this is also a question when I'm going to see the, the perovskite solar cells in the market. So, this is one of the companies that it was uh, uh, Professor Henry Snate, uh, was the, let's say, the creator of this, uh, the company Oxford PV, although the, the, uh, the factory is actually in Germany. So or Oxford PV, I just checked the website uh, yesterday and they're still claiming that this year we are gonna see, are gonna see uh, they are gonna be the first company to sell what we call like tandem solar cells. What is a tandem? Uh, as you can see here, a tandem is when you have like two uh, different um, photovoltaics, uh, cells together in order to match, in order to increase the absorption of light. So then you have the silicon solar cells here in the bottom, and then you put the, the perovskite solar cells on the top. With that, when you have this uh, tandem, you can increase uh, your efficiency close to 30%, okay? There's also interesting um, comment here on the website. Um, 35 kilograms of the perovskites generates the same amount, uh, uh, the same amount of powers as seven tons of silicon. Okay, so I think it's an interesting comment about the perovskite. But as I mentioned, they're still uh, planning to, to launch. I don't know. Uh, let's see. Uh, this the technology uh, this this year in the market. Uh, in terms of, this is for Tandem, but in terms of only the, the, the panel, only the, the perovskite solar module, so the record is still from January uh, last year, it's still 16% from Panasonic in an in area of uh, 800 uh, square centimeters. Uh, we also we are doing our model in this, in, in this project with Shell. Our goal is to reach by next year 20, uh, 20, uh, by 20 uh, square centimeters. This is an example of our model working in, in Campinas. Uh, we are using here, in, we are using, we, we are just uh, collaborating with Sesen, the company that makes these uh, large OPV uh, panels here in Brazil, and MG Graphene. Uh, we're replacing uh, the gold by uh, the, this gold here on the top, as you can see, by carbon materials. Uh, but uh, instead of o Oxford PV, Sauli was actually the first technology, was the first company actually to, to put the perovskite in the market. But you can see here uh, only for to power what we call like Internet of Things devices. So they are making flexible um, perovskite uh, solar modules. But the, their ultimate goal is uh, is to use as uh, just for instance use 
uh, this Internet of Things, they use a lot of this the lights here. For instance, this ambient light, this, this is about one ten of sun. Uh, when you use the perovskite at this uh, luminosity here that we have in our in, in our house, for instance, you can increase the efficiency. So this 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 uh, sol is is uh, is a Polish company. And then recently, uh, also NRL uh, have this space mission tests. Uh, the NRL is testing these perovskite solar cells in. Uh, it's a very interesting sites to, to look at. It was uh, launching this. Uh, Perovskite solar cells to test them in a space. This is interesting because in a space we don't we, we just get rid of, of the humidity, okay? So they're expecting to be more stable. So okay, what we're doing in Campinas now? We are, as I mentioned, we are using uh, we're coupling in situ experiments with synchrotron radiation. So uh, most of the all of the data actually that I'm going to present here was uh, were done in the in, in the old uh, machine. That it was the second generation, uh, the UVX, that it was closed in 2019. Uh, this is the Sirius, is the new uh, four generation synchrotron. Uh, it's really amazing. Definitely, you need to, to see it's amazing the facilities in there. It's, it's a huge complex. It's, uh, it's really impressive. In, it's just 10 minutes from the University of Campinas. So why, why the synchrotron radiation is really interesting to, to characterize materials because it's a high flux uh, energy as, as a, for those that are not familiar with the synchrotron, this is what you have here. This is the electron storage ring. So we have electrons here moving at the speed of light. When these electrons, they, they pass through this bending magnet or insertion device, we produce light. This is the uh, synchrotron radiation. So then you can set some monochromators, then you can tune uh, the energy of your, um, of your radiation. And then you can use some focus uh, optics in order to, for this radiation to reach your sample. And then you can do um, lots of experiments here uh, from not only from X-rays, most common, of course, experiments are, are done with X-rays, but you can use UV visible. And I'm showing an example here when we use the infrared. Uh, so what's interesting for, for perovskite solar cells, so because if you couple in situ or open on this experiment with synchrotron, uh, you can, for instance, uh, probe the beginning of the formation of the allied perovskite solution. Also, you can follow the formation of the film. And I'm, um, this, I'm going to show examples here uh, when we track the formation in solution. And also we, we look at the formation in, uh, in the film using two different deposition methods. But also you can uh, follow the, the crystallization. This is something is really important to achieve high performance devices. And also you can track, for instance, the degradation. So we have done all of these experiments in B-line, but because of time, uh, I'll just focus on the formation of the proof the, of the metal light proof skies. So it's starting with the it's starting with the probing the formation in solution. So in this case, uh, this was a 2D um, perovskites, uh, as you can see here, this is the composition. Uh, we use this uh, butyl ammonium, this is a kind of, uh, for us, is a kind of large molecule that allows you to, to prepare 2D materials. So uh, this was done by that time by my master's student, Rafael. He came up with the synthesis at the room temperature. I'm going to show here, it's very easy to, to sensitize. It's just a mixture of the two precursors. It's very quick. And then you have the formation of this very nice 2D perovskite in micro size, okay? Uh, and also we can deposit this, uh, the films in a substrate and depends on the number of layers, this is for N equal to two, where you have two layers, two, two D layers. In fact, you can have this very nice, uh, it's a very nice luminescent material. Okay, so what we did was we set this, as I mentioned, we set this uh, experimental setup here on a, on a B line, in this case, on a sax. Now, as, as you can see here, the, all of the, uh, all of the setup, and we are controlling the injection from from outside. So let's see the so let's see the results. So this is basically uh, we are using uh, the synchrotron uh, X rays. This is our uh, chemical uh, vessel here. 
So this is the image that you can get from this experiment. This is a 2G fax image. Of course, we're doing a lot of treatment on this in order to get what is familiar for us. This intensity versus Q. Remember that Q is related to, to theta. So you can see here in the beginning, you just see like a broad signal. As we start to see the formation of 2G, uh, we can follow this, uh, this signal here. It starts to become like a narrow and more intense. So what this is interesting, because as we are probing, we are doing these experiments with time. So that means that you can do some kinetics here using, uh, using these in situ experiments. And with that, uh, we were able to, to see what was going on here. So for instance, this was just after the injection. And then we start in, in between, in, uh, within 10 seconds, we start to see the information of these individual labs. As I mentioned before, this is n equal to two. What does it mean? I have two layers of octahedra here, but I could also set the synthesis for n equal to one or n equal to two, whatever, okay? So it depends on the, on the stoichiometry. So in this case, it was n equal to two. So after 10 seconds, you see here the self-assembling of these labs. As we are doing this in situ, we can calculate the growth rates that it was about 3.3 angstroms per second. This is, it mean, what does it mean? It means that two labs, okay, two labs of that takes about six seconds in order to, to self-assemble. So this, uh, this, this, the work of, uh, was a front cover of the chemistry of materials in, uh, in 2019. I think it was the first time that it was uh, in, the in the literature where we could see the formation of these uh, 2G materials in solution. Okay, well, so let's talk about the films because films are much more interesting for, for PV. Uh, this was uh, the one step is the most, nowadays is the most used uh, method to prepare the proskite. Basically, we start with the precursors in solution uh, you can you can just use like uh, our precursors. The purity is around uh, nine percent. It's low cost. Uh, you just mix it, for instance, lead iodide with methionine iodide, and then you have uh, a solution of the uh, mapping map in this case. So uh, then, when you have the precursor with like all the um, the components, you go to your spin coater and you start depositing uh, the solution, the precursor solution that you can, for instance, Solaronic is, is is just selling you by, you can just you can just purchase the precursor solution or you can prepare them in the lab. It's, it's very very easy. So then, uh, okay, so it'll go to a spin coater and just a few seconds before you switch off your spin coater, you drop what we call like an antisolvent. This is the most important step I'm going to show you uh, in the next, I have a video to show here that in that moment, we see the formation of the perovskite. So you see the change in the color from like yellow to brown. And of course, we still need some annealing but only 10 minutes, for instance, maximum half an hour in order to form the perovskite film. And then you proceed with the deposition of the other layers and deposit your um, electrodes, then you have your device. But then let's look at this, this uh, anti-solvent here. This is a most important step. So this is a video and show that this is my postdoc, Fran. Uh, now she's going to deposit the... She's going to deposit the, the layer, the solution. You can see it's, uh, I want you to just to pay attention to the change of color as soon as she's going to drop the solvent. So in, uh, in our case, we're doing this in, uh, inside of a glove box, but also we can do it uh, outside of the glove box. There's no much, a huge difference uh, in, in terms of uh, efficiency. Can you see now? There's a change in the color. And then you have the formation of the perovskites in this, in this step. Okay, the problem when you use this kind of uh, ink, many researchers call like perovskite ink, from precursors with low purity. Uh, and as you can, as I can, as you, as you saw in this video, it's a very easy deposition method. Okay, so uh, even after annealing, Sometimes this is the, the structure that you really want to form. There's the cubic perovskite, okay? But it's really hard to not form other phases, what we call like hexagonal phases, especially because these hexagonal phases are more 
thermodynamically uh, favored to form instead of the cubic perovskite. And you don't want these hexagonal phases, okay? Why you don't want the hexagonal phases? Because they are non-active. If you look, if you compare the structure of these the two phases, the cubic phase and the, the hexagonal phase, you can see here that the octahedra here in the yellow phase, they are not connected to each other. So it means that in this case for the yellow phase, they are yellow, it means that they are absorbing in a, in a in condition with there is a high, a high band gap semiconductor. Uh, so it is not interested because we are just, um, you're not covering, you're not absorbing uh, most part of the visible or the, inf the, of, the of the infrared. Uh, and also this in terms of transport, the mobility here is, is pretty low. Okay, so what we, we don't want these yellow phases. So uh, our first uh, our first work in the uh, uh, in the synchrotron with metal light perovskite was not with X rays but it was with infrared. So the question was okay after forming the film, is, can we see where these yellow phases? Can you see where they are in, in the film? So this was the the work of Rodrigo, uh, the PhD of Rodrigo. He's now a postdoc in a synchrotron. So we, we use the infrared uh, radiation, uh, radiation from the synchrotron coupled to a AFM. So in this case, uh, this technique is called like, uh, uh, we call like, it's easy to say like nano, inf nano infrared, okay? But the, the most, uh, the correct name is scattering scanning near field optical microscopy because we are generating a really strong field with a really high resolution here of 25, nanometers. So then you have your sample here. This is the AFM tip. So the infrared light is actually uh, uh, reaching here, the, the tip of the AFM. And what we are detecting is this is the scattering of the infrared light. Okay. With this technique that is now, according to my colleague, the synchrotron, they are under, uh, they are co uh, under commissioning. It means that they are already performing internal experiments, then it's gonna be open for uh, users, I think, now in, the, in uh, by, the, the, by, uh, by the middle of this year, you're gonna be able to submit proposals to this bin line. So what is nice here, because you can have two types, you can get two types of information. You can have like the spectral analysis, you can do like, uh, I, you can you can have the image, the, the, the what you call like a broadband image of your, your sample, but also you can, go, you can get the point spectrum. It means that you can just choose one grain, okay? One point here, and you can have an infrared spectrum of that point here. I'm gonna show you here. Uh, of course, this is, is a complex technique. Um, I will need much more time to explain the details, but I just want to show how powerful is this technique um, for other materials instead of the perovskite. So this is the same image that I showed you before. And this is the what we call like infrared broadband image. So this is the AFM topography on the left. On the right, you can see here, this is just on, let's take this grain here of the perovskite. What you see here is the intensity of the infrared that is scattered is different. You can see here there is more intense, I believe there is more intense uh, in the grain boundaries. What does it mean? It means that if it's more intense, it means that I have less molecules absorbing the infrared light. In our case, uh, is the organic cation. So we believe is that close to the grain boundaries, we have a depletion of these organic cations that are located on the A side of the perovskite. So you see here, the conclusion here is like, if you look at just one grain of perovskite in terms of composition, is very, very homogeneous. Um, so what we did, we did many uh, experiments at the time, but I'm just focused on, on a yellow phase. So this is the point spectrum here. Uh, as you can see, this is just in a high magnification, this AFM topography, the infrared broad image on the, on the right. Let's take here uh, uh, image D, okay? Uh, what we see is a different color. It means that these grains are different than the grains underneath. And then you can just go there, you can choose whatever you can set your AFM tip and you can get high infrared spectrum. In that case, we're just probing the, the anti-symmetric stretching of the formamidinium, and we are able to, uh, to, of course, together with other analysis, we're able to say, okay, these greener grains that you can see here are definitely what we call like the hexagonal phases. So if you have a sample, uh, when you have a contrast, 
in terms of infrared absorption. So this is a very nice beam line to use here in Campinas. Okay, and then we changed, we went to the X, uh, X uh, what's the name of the beam line? X, I think it was X-ray two is another beam line in synchrotron when we decide to probe the formation of the perovskite film. So in this case, uh, we did the GWOX, that is the grazing incidence wide angle X-ray scattering. So basically in this technique, uh, this is your uh, X-ray beam. This is your this is your film here. This is the image that you can get that's uh, in your in your 2D detector. Um, so we managed at that time to actually to we brought the our spin coater from from our our lab in in Campinas, and uh, we set the spin coater as you can see in a beam line. Okay, uh, this the, the X-ray comes from this uh, this way here. It is your area detector. Uh, also, we built we built this chamber here uh, around the the spin coater, where we are able to control the atmosphere inside, and now so the time to inject the solvent. Okay. Also, this work was made by Rodrigo. So we use this kind of perovskite here with cesium and formamidinium, and also with mix alloys. So these are data that you can get when you go to the synchrotron, where you can perform in situ experiments. So. This is the, you can plot the Q. Remember that Q is related to, to theta. You can plot Q as a function of the time. So this is what we have here. In the beginning of the, of the spin coater, when it just dropped the, the uh, precursor solution, we have this blurry signal here. And then when you drop the solvent, then, then you start to see the formation of the perovskite. This peak here uh, in uh, equal, uh, Q equal to 10 uh, nanometers minus one is the peak of the cubic perovskite, but also, as you can see here, we have some peaks below 10 that corresponds to uh, the hexagonal phases. So also is interesting because as we're doing this with time, you can plot intensity versus time. And that this is what you see here, that first we have the formation of the perovskite phases. And as the solvent starts to uh, evaporate, then you see, uh, the formation of the uh, of the perovskite. So there's a convert the cubic perovskite. So the hexagonal phases are converted to cubic perovskite with just evaporation uh, of the solvent that uh, from the precursor solution. And then we decide to change the, the time to to drop the solvent because this this was done totally uh, in in our lab. If you use this uh, solvent method, you can it, this is done manually. Okay. So this is nice. So when you drop the solvent 50 se 15 seconds after the spin coating process, this is nice. You, you, at the end, you have a very nice morphology of the film. But look at what happens if you take too much time to drop your solvent. Okay. Of course, that we we changed it. We changed many parameters in this work here. But I want to show you here that this uh, this time to to, to drop the solvent is really crucial. Uh, you need to drop the solvent while you still have the signal from the precursor solution. Okay, see this blurry signal here. So you need to have this uh, signal from the precursor solution. If you drop here, where you don't have the signal anymore, so the morphology is really, really poor. But then we decide to move to another uh, deposition method, because as I mentioned before, these methods, everything is done manually uh, inside of a glove box. Uh, so then we try to use in nowadays this the, the method that we use to deposit our perovskite is what we call like a gas quenching. What is this gas quench? Instead of using the chlorobenzene as the dent solvent, you can use, for instance, nitrogen. Okay. Uh, and also instead of the spin coater, you can use in, this, in our case. I see if I can play this video here. Ah, uh, it's not working. Uh, I'll try to pass. So. Uh, this is what we call like a blade coater. So what's the interesting from this method here? We can exclude toxic solvent because we are using nitrogen to form the perovskite. We avoid the saturation of the atmosphere of our glove box and it's scalable if you really think about large area depositions. So basically this is the precursor solution, okay? Uh, I'm going to put the change here. You can see you can spread this film, and the nitrogen is uh, the nitrogen is, is coming from from the top. Okay, Galo, can you see this? Okay, now it's working. Uh, 
Okay, and then you can see here is a very nice transparent transparent film of blue sky. So then uh, we decided to compare both methods. This is the insolvent versus the gas quenching method. So what we can what we can see here, for instance, this is the result that I showed you before. Okay, uh, in this case here, you see that it takes much more time for the pure skies to form. So the crystallization is much slower when you use this method, but you still have the formation of the hexagonal phase. Even at the end of the, of the experiment, you still have the formation of the hexagonal phases. So again, first you form the hexagonal phases, then you form the pure sky. So what means that here, after this deposition, the annealing step is really, really important to remove all the hexagonal phases prior assembling your, your device. Okay. Oh, uh, to get all of these works, uh, we show the, the mechanism of the formation of these pearl skies. Of course, this really is very complex and depends on the composition, depends on the, um, the humidity or other, and if you are kneeling or not. But as you can see, uh, we start with the hexagonal phases and from the hexagonal phases, uh, sometimes you, you pass through a complex, an intermediate, otherwise you go straight to the cubic perovskite. In some cases, you really need to complete this stage by annealing the film. Okay, uh, and then I think I'm approaching the end of my talk. I just want to show you the, the new, uh, one of the new beam lines, of course, it's uh, the other uh, beam lines that are very interesting, but this is the one that we are actually uh, working very close to the, to the people in the, in the synchrotron, uh, is the called Carnauba, okay? Uh, Carnauba is, uh, is a nanoprobe station. Uh, as you can see here, you can, you, can, this, you can set your sample here. So what interesting is like, you can be able to do, you're gonna be able to do at the same time, you can be able to do what, for instance, nano diffraction, but also be able to do, for instance, um, as you have here, a fluorescence detector and luminescence detector, you can do, for instance, you can do PL, you can do X-ray fluorescence, everything at the same time, okay? Uh, what we're doing now with, uh, uh, also this, uh, this is Pablo, I don't know, Gallo, uh, I think Gallo, the community here in Argentina knows Pablo, Pablo is from Argentina, but is my colleague here in, uh, in Campinas. Pablo developed this a special um, here on the left, he developed this special uh, electro electrochemical cell to put in the nanoprobe because Pablo, uh, Pablo is working with the electrochemistry of glycerol to, uh, to produce hydrogen. So the idea here is, for instance, you can, uh, you can set your, for, uh, your material, for instance, your uh, semiconductor or even your metal, for instance, if you're doing some electrolysis, whatever, and you can put this... Uh, uh, you can set this electrochemical in the in the in a, in a beam line. Rodrigo, that was my postdoc, it was my master, my PhD student. Now he's a postdoc on a, uh, on Sirius. He developed this another um, there's another setup here. This is a, for a, a perovskite solar cell, and also to put in in the Carnauba. So we're going to be able to uh, imagine that uh, at the same time that we're recording. Uh, the device, I mean, the, we are uh, devising, uh, we are uh, doing the operando experiment. I mean, um, we are just doing the, the characterization of the solar cell. I'll be able to, do, to track the changes uh, in the crystal structure of the Peru sky. So all of these two um, small um, uh, setups here will be able to put here. This is the photo of the, the Carnauba, just right here, as you can see. Okay, so if you're interested in doing some electrochemistry experiments, so please contact Pablo. If you're interested in doing some operando uh, experiments in, in solar cells, other kind of devices, you can contact Rodrigo. So with that, uh, I hope that I have uh, uh, convinced you that the ProSky materials uh, have extraordinary properties. I still many things that I think you, you still need to comprehend in this material. What is nice because it means that you can get a lot of a, a space, a lot of uh, room to, to improve and to work. Uh, the first stage is uh, in the proscite formation, and uh, even in solution, the film is very complex. 
depends on the many, many important parameters. Uh, and all of this is going to affect the morphology and device uh, efficiency. That's the reason that it's important to, to look at this, uh, the first stages and the formation of these materials. Not less important, we need to also to understand more about the degradation. As I mentioned before, in the Golden Triangle, uh, we still need to improve uh, the stability. And I think with these operando experiments that are going to do right now in the Carnauba, we can get more information about this kind of degradation. And here, this is my message. The synchrotron is here in Campinas. It's, it's, very close to, it's very close to Buenos Aires. And I know that they are already receiving proposals. If you really want to contact me uh, for, for, me, for me to introduce to some uh, researchers in the synchrotron, just please just write me an email. And with that, I also would like to thank my group, my colleagues in, uh, in, uh, in the Pain, where is the synchrotron is. It's, uh, it's called the Centro Nacional de Pesquisa em Energia e Materiais. The series is part of the Pain. My sponsors, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Anna, for your very, very nice talk. Um, uh, we are now open to questions, if there are any. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Very beautiful seminar. Fantastic. I love this. I have a couple of questions on the formation of the, of the 2D materials of the of the perovskite one is uh, in one moment i understood that the hexagonal uh, was more stable than the than the cubic was it like that why why does it go the other way when you anneal you get the cubic is it um, yeah. it's, it, it's interesting because uh, i think it's because definitely it's because you are kneeling uh you see the formation in the beginning so mm -hmm. Before the cubic, you see the formation of the hexagonal phases, okay. And also, I didn't, I didn't have time to show, but even when it starts to degrade, you start forming the hexagonal phases, okay. In the degradation, I didn't have time to show that. Okay. So you you have hexagonal okay. phases mm -hmm. in the, in the beginning, and then you form your perovskite. But any, if I mean, if you increase the humidity, whatever, it also it starts to form. The diagonal phases again, okay. Mm. Uh, it's really, it's really tricky. Of course, you can uh, get rid of of the diagonal phase with annealing. Then you are favoring the cubic, okay. Uh, of course, in the in the case of the compositions that we are working, uh, if there is no humidity, if you're really sealing very well your devices, you can keep the perovskite in the cubic formation in a, in the cubic structure. Mm. Mike Tony uh, showed that even during the device operation, when you are doing the device, it's uh, the cubic is stable. Okay, when you're doing your uh, JV curves, okay, the, the cubic, uh, the structure is, is still cubic, is still there. But the problem is that when you have some kind of humidity, for instance, and then it starts to form and in a, in a single size to form the diagonal phases, the efficiency is going to drop a lot. Mm -hmm. okay. My dog has a question also. No, a second uh, fast question. Um, when you show the, um, the growth of the crystallites, uh, do you have an in-plane fast growth and then the assembly? That you see it by using different peaks? Uh, in, in the socks? Yes. For the... Yeah. Yeah, because we didn't... What, what do you mean? The, no, we, we just, we just fall in the solution. At the end, it was the only in solution. I, I was intrigued if you are uh, observing the socks signal for the shape of the, of the nanocrystals, or if you're also following in, in socks at, at higher angle. Uh, no, no, we're, we're just, no, 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 no. We didn't, we didn't get to lower angles, but we are going to do right now. Okay. From that, there was a delay in the, in the commissioning of the SACs here. Mm. So is the only, I think is the, the most delayed beam line now, because no, we, we only, we don't track that range of, 
that range of Q. Only you see only the, that peak that you see is for the stacking of the 2G. It's the stacking. Okay, perfect. It's the stacking. It's the, it's, it's the peak for, for, the, for, for the stacking. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Beautiful seminar. Fantastic. Thank you. Is there any other question for the audience? I have a, I have another one. Uh, uh, Diego? No, Diego, Diego. Yes, Diego. it's uh, thank you, Anna. It was a very nice seminar. I I am not really related to the topic, but I have a few questions about the uh, some of the capabilities that you mentioned about the serious synchrotron and, and you discuss a bit about using AFM to do topography, but also to have uh, analysis by uh, IR. I don't know if this can be combined with any other types of characterization. And you showed that you have a resolution of 25 nanometers. And I mean, uh, what's the sensitivity? I mean, if I have a one layer of of molecules, can can you have that type of uh, resolution, or what's the limitation? And besides that, is like you can use it, for example, on on XPS, for example, or some other spectroscopy. No, exactly. The, this this being nine the nano if the, the nano infrared. Uh, yeah. As far as I know, is they only using uh, um, infrared. Okay. Infrared. It's only mm -hmm. there is an infrared. So yes, you have a, a 25 nanometers and you can do it so as a monolayer. Definitely, I think the first the first uh, experiment that they have done there was with graphene. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the layers, monolayers, yeah. uh, monolayers of graphene is 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 really impressive because if you remember my talk. We can able to look at just one grain. There is yeah. about 20, 20, that grain is about 200 nanometers. Okay. And you could see with that resolution, uh, I mean, you can just go there and track. You can just follow, you can track, put the, your AFM, whatever you want. You can follow grain by grain. Okay. With this resolution. This is something really, this is really amazing. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Actually, if, if for example, I put you in, in a, a hypothetical situation, if you have an array of, of gonal particles, let's say it's in the size of 10 nanometers, of course, this is below the resolution that you mentioned, but let's say you can map a larger uh, surface area and you have molecules on those gonal particles. In principle, you should be able to, to see that, right? To see the, the molecules? Oh, on top okay. of the of the nanoparticles of the metal nanoparticles. So this also these are infrared spectroscopy. So we need to some some peaks. Sometimes we cannot observe because of the 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 ratio of uh, the the noise. Because yeah, I'm, I'm, so I'm, there's an advantage now in in the new beam line. Okay, yeah. because then then we're gonna be able to be more sensitive. Uh, for instance, in our case, we're only able to probe just one the stretching of the one of the, the molecule, just one one kind of peak we are able to 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 follow. This something is interesting. Yeah, I, I will say molecules easy to monitor, like you have aromatic structures of stuff like that. Yeah, so you need to select because you have to be aware that it's uh, uh, some maybe some of the bands because of the noise, maybe you cannot see. Mm -hmm. Now they improve a lot. So they really minimize the noise in the in the new beam line, okay. So then what you have to do is like first you have this broad, you have to get this uh, we'll call like the infrared broad image because you see that if if there are contrasts, mm. okay. This is the first thing that you do if you see that if there are contrasts, and then you can you can monitor it go with your AFM tip you and if you can able to to take this infrared uh, point spectrum, okay. And, and now that then it's going to be depending on a sample or even in order to, because as I mentioned, sometimes you are really looking for a specific band, but maybe you cannot see because it's mm -hmm. too weak the absorption. If, if that, 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 that specific transition is, is too small, then you cannot see. Okay, well, that, that's great. Okay, thank you. 
I have a very fast question. I, I was very impressed uh, with the blender coating technique. And I was wondering if, uh, is there any chance to study the temperature, the, the depositing, depositing temperature influence on the final product? And I don't know if, if, it, if it is important at all. But. No, no, that's true. Uh, in, in that kind of video that I show you, it was, we, we just chose one temperature, but we just um, uh, purchased another blade culture now that we can also change the, you can also change the, the, the temperature of the, the, the position on the, on the plates. So this is definitely, so we are testing now. Now this makes a huge difference. Great, thanks. Because the, if, you, if you think about, I don't know if, if, you, if you realize that the perovskite is so unique, that is, is the photovoltaic material that you are actually forming while you are actually uh, doing the crystallization. It's not happening with silicon and other technologies. So you are just like depositing, uh, you are crystal, you are forming, you are forming the proviscite while you are depositing the film. It's really amazing. Yeah. So then all, this, all these parameters, uh, atmosphere and annealing, the, the, the penetration for annealing, all of these things are really important when you are forming the probe sky. That's great and also difficult. <laughs> yeah, but we achieve with using, the, using this uh, gas quenching because I really had problems with my glove box because what happens like with time, Imagine, of course, you saturate the atmosphere of a glove box with a lot of the solvent. Okay, so it was much better for us when we moved to gas quenching. And even our record, our record is 21%. We can get 25 like Juan Pablo, but we can get 21% is using gas quenching. That's great. Well, thank you again, Anna. And um, all of you for being here. And um, I think there are no 